Warning, if you're offended by vulgar language, you might want to lay back on your fainting couch in advance. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Adam and Eve and by Novocaine. Because as bad as dental work sucks, it used to suck more. Go science. And now, The Scathing Atheist. I'm Christian. I'm Maggie. I'm Nikki. I'm Sandra. I'm George. I'm Hertzie. And I am Alicia Ann. As admins of the Puzzle in the Thunderstorm Facebook group, we can confirm that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men, women, and envies. Now stop posting dicks in the group, guys. No real dicks, no fake dicks, no silicone dicks, no dicks. It's July 1st. And Noah's back! Woo! Thank you. Oh, and you wrote into the notes that I missed you too, Eli. That was nice of you. I'm (laughs) Noah Illusions. Uh, Who had zero seconds for him killing that moment. (laughs) I had zero. zero. I'm Eli Bosnick. (laughs) Okay, I'm Ethan Wright. And from... Carmen, the Christian Singers, New Jersey. How dare you? Cincinnati Red State and Red Town Blue State. (laughs) This is The Scathing Atheist. On oh, this week's episode, Noah's back, so I don't have to do work anymore. Republicans are pretty sure the critical race theory was calling from inside the <laughs> house. <laughs> and Ken Ham will learn how hard he can fuck himself. But first, the diatribe. If you want to know what it's like to acclimate to dentures, here's what you do. Go grab a jar of peanut butter, take off the lid, and stick it in your mouth. Now hold it there while you talk to people and eat your lunch. It's like that, only with sores all over your gums. Now, I have it on good authority that most people eventually get used to it and carry on like they did when they still had teeth. But I've talked to enough people now to know that some folks also don't. Right, Some people wear them only at work or when they're in public or when they have to, and they learn to eat with their gums, and they just get used to sounding kind of funny when they talk. And given that I talk for a living, that knowledge scared the hell out of me. There was a point a few days after I got my teeth evicted where I wondered if I was going to have to start looking for another job. Now, if you follow me on Facebook, you saw all of this playing out in real time. A lot of people who wear dentures are embarrassed to admit it, and a lot of people who have trouble with them are embarrassed to admit that they're getting their asses kicked by something that their grandma managed to get through, but I'm an open book. The whole point of crafting the No Illusions persona was so that I could be completely honest with you, so I publicly documented the entire ordeal in a series of long and admittedly self-pitying Facebook posts. And I'm really glad I did because my friends on Facebook were the main resource I used to get through the anxiety that was otherwise crippling me through those first couple of weeks. See, I'm really lucky in that regard. Between fans of the show, the online atheist communities that I'm a part of, my real life friends and my family, I've got a really robust social support network. So in addition to business partners that were perfectly okay with me easing myself back into work over a month long period, I had a ton of emotional support when I was shrouded in depression. I had so many people trying to help me from so many different directions that one of them was bound to get through. Hell, it's the same reason I was able to quit smoking. It was because of you. And the whole time I'm basking in all the encouragement and sympathy, I kept thinking about what a fucking demon you would have to be to take that away from someone. See, like a a lot of introverted atheists, I never really had a social support network before. I, I never went to church. I've never belonged to a club I'm not particularly close to anybody in my family. I've always had friends, but, you know, not of the share our problems and be vulnerable with one another variety. So when I heard about churches that ostracize members and encourage people to shun their own family, I knew it was a terrible thing to do, but I didn't recognize how terrible. You know those studies you see from time to time that show how religious people live longer than non-religious people? Yeah, this is why. When you just look at religious people who don't regularly attend a church, you see that difference disappear. Just like it does when you compare churchgoers with atheists who belong to groups that meet regularly. Now, religious people trot that statistic out all the time as though it supports their faith somehow. But what it really tells you is that when you withdraw support from apostates, you're taking years off their lives. Right? Like The weaponization of the social support network has deadly consequences. Still, though, it's something that religions are better at than us. 
I mean, I, I get why newly minted atheists are leery of anything that remotely smells like a church. And at a certain point, any group that meets regularly might start smelling like a church. And I also get why introverts are hesitant to put themselves through the anxiety of trying to join a club or go to a weekly meeting of any kind. But you still owe it to yourself to try. Maybe you're like me and you never had a social support network, so you think you're fine without one. Maybe you had one ripped away from you by some heartless tenet of your former faith and don't want to leave yourself vulnerable to that again, but you still owe it to yourself. And if that's not enough to convince you, think of all the people that might need you. You could be the reason that somebody smiles for the first time in days. You could be the reason somebody realizes that they can too carry on. You can be the reason somebody gets out of bed in the morning and tries again. Hell, some of you are already that reason for me, and you probably don't even know it. The biggest failing of the atheist community is in its inclusivity. Our charge, and, and by our, I mean Heath, Eli, Lucinda, and myself, is to create that community, right? That was the whole point of starting the show. And I think that by and large, we've succeeded in it. But our success is proportional to the number of people who can benefit from that community, right? Like if nobody gets the advantage but me, it's a miserable fucking failure. Look, I get it. People are assholes. Right? The internal politics of any club get to be a pain in the ass eventually. Social gatherings can be stressful as hell. Obligations to other people are a burden by definition. And maybe you think you don't need them. Maybe you think you're fine on your own. And maybe you're even right. But even if you don't need the community, the community might still need you. And if it turns out you were wrong and you actually do need a community to support you, it'll be too late to find one. Hi. I'm Eli Bosnick, here with our resident sexually inexperienced cast member, Heath Enright, to tell you all okay. about this week's sponsor, AdamandEve.com. I'm, it's not, I'm not inexperienced. I am s selective. I'm a sex connoisseur, I guess is how I would say it. Adam and Eve is a sex and sex work positive LGBTQ friendly company that loads on the free fuck stuff. So today, I'll be quizzing Heath on some of their products to see if he can guess what they are. Heath, are you ready? I am not ready. I don't like this. Just can you can you just read the ad copy? All read, right. First up, Heath. Okay. What kind of product is Eve's sweetheart swirl? Uh, is it a candy? Oh, I'm afraid not. It is a solid glass dildo. And if you wanted to purchase that dildo, you could for 50% off plus free shipping using the code scathing at checkout. All right, let's do another one. Heath, where do Magnus's mighty magnetic orbs go? Um... I feel like that's in your butt. Is it nope. in your butt? No, nope. so close. They are for your nipples. What? Nipples. Yes. And assuming you bought them using the code scathing at checkout, you'd get 10 tantalizing free gifts. That's scathing, S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G, offer code scathing at checkout at adamandeve.com. One last one for you here, Heath. What is the Liberator Wanda? The glass dildo. Ooh, so close. It is a pillow you put your wand massager in. Come on. Yeah. So remember, everyone, don't be a Heath and get your sex stuff at adamandeve.com. Adamandeve.com. All the sex stuff you know about and a bunch of it you don't. A pillow like to sleep on? Yeah. That is? No, like to sleep on. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the schmear to my everything, Eli Bosnick. Eli, are you ready to spread the good word? Okay, not spread, he's schmear. We're going to schmear the good word. Okay, I evolved it from the one. It's fine. <laughs> I'll explain later. In our lead story tonight, we're going to start with a quick little exercise to make sure we have the right audience for this. Ooh, all gonna right. Get into the topic nice and slow. Critical race theory. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and now that we've scared away the bigots who tuned in because they heard atheism had merged with the far right. That's not this show. <laughs> Go away. Good. You're gone. Now we can talk about a concept that is illegal to teach in public schools, including <sighs> universities in a growing handful of bigot states. So in very simple terms, critical race theory is just saying, all right, guys, history happened. Yep. And there's been racism. That's it. <sighs> Just don't be a liar when you talk about it. Just don't lie. That's part of it. <laughs> so now the liars are fucking terrified. And of course, that includes pretty much the entire Christian right. Anna? What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. The Christian white is freaking out. Yes, they are. And that most definitely includes their drizzly mascot, Pat Robertson. 
He joined the panicky chorus last week and he called critical race theory, quote, a monstrous evil. Okay. Do you think P. Robes has a things Christians are mad about, but I don't understand at all mad libs at the ready? Because this <laughs> felt like a mad libs. Very mad libs. So that's almost everything he does. Yeah, I think that's just the format of his show you just described. So just in case anyone missed it, here's a tiny bit more detail on critical race theory. It's an academic framework that very correctly includes our long history of systemic racism as an important piece of context for examining our political institutions and our entire socioeconomic structure. Yeah. One might say it's a growing competitor in the marketplace of ideas, actually. <laughs> but the fucking bad guys called time out on that whole thing. That mm. messes up their, their argument for this particular moment, so they called time out. And as part of their campaign to stifle free speech with big government, that's what they're doing now. As part of that campaign, twitchy conservative white America is turning critical race theory into this insane caricature of all their deepest fears. Like they were huffing with scarecrow. <laughs> and here's what Pat Robertson thinks critical race theory is. And you know, what? we're going to need to take this in pieces. It's yep. fucking rough. Mm -hmm. He starts by saying, quote, critical race theory says that people of color have been oppressed by the white people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> and that white people begin to be racist by the time they're two or three months old. Okay. So kind of went downhill there after the first half. Of that Look, here's the thing. I don't want to play translate Pat Robertson into reality, but it's kind of our job. We kind of, so that's our thing. I think what he's referencing is a study done at the university of Toronto that shows that babies might associate sad what? or negative music uh, with darker skinned absolutely people. Absolutely not what he's talking about. Okay. But he could also just have pulled that out of his ass. Yes, he's Pat Robertson. There are no rules. No, there's there's you think he's referencing a study from a university right now. <laughs> I I don't fair. Fair. From Canada. You think he knows where <laughs> Toronto is? No, absolutely none of that. It's not coming together. You're right. It's not that. Okay. <laughs> he continued with his definition here. Therefore. People of color have to rise up and overtake their oppressors. <laughs> and then, having gotten the whip handle, if I can use the term, and no, you cannot. You absolutely cannot. <laughs> hey, hey, very few people can use the term less, Pat Robertson. Yep. Very few. <laughs> no, you may not. Are you asking? Could somebody stop you in, <laughs> in the studio, maybe, if you're going to ask rhetorical questions? God damn it. Okay, whatever. He actually said... Having gotten the whip handle, they're going to instruct their white neighbors how to behave. Wow. So he had to use the term whip handle when talking about black people. Yes, he Because did. it's the only metaphor he can think of for teaching people to behave. It's, even if it's not the only one, that's the one he said. He, oh, that, he thought of that. You double extra can't use that term, Pat Robertson. More. Jesus. Extra. No. <laughs> You're really bad at Mad Libs, man. You're really so bad. bad. It's just, you need, you need a few guidelines about <laughs> that. All right, and here is the big close from Pat Robertson. This is the way the communists take over. I don't, like, when, when is he? Yep. What is he talking mm -hmm. about? How is this communist for it? Anyway, he continues. They try to destroy the children. It's a monstrous evil. You don't want to have your children in third grade indoctrinated into a hate group so that he'll wind up hating people or hating himself. And so the white people are supposed to feel guilty and they're supposed to have white guilt and the people of color are supposed to cleanse them of that guilt by taking over. Again, it's a monstrous evil, end quote. Okay. At least we can comfort ourselves knowing that he alienated a bunch of his audience by saying you don't want your kids getting into a hate group. That's going to cost him, <laughs> right? That's going to... That's going to hurt his numbers. <laughs> and just the record, if you go back through Robertson's little speech there and you switch out critical race theory for Christianity as what he was talking about, a bunch of that ridiculous fucking rant actually becomes accurate. Mm -hmm. Christian people do tell their neighbors how to behave. Their kids do become bigots. They join hate groups. Yep. It's monstrous evil. It really fixes a bunch of that if you make that switch. <laughs> When when you are is actually a good argument, it 
that's not a good sign. Like at the end of it, I could have said you are in the studio and he would have had to be like, oh, yeah. Damn, damn. Also, one other thing. If this whole backlash to critical race theory seems to have come out of nowhere. No, it hasn't. <laughs> this has been workshopped by religion for years now. And now that they have the support of a bunch of Christian politicians, they're putting it into action, you know, like religion does. So the whole thing for a separate reason, I was looking this up by my own research. And keep in mind, that just means searching our Google Docs for keywords. Oh, you didn't go to the University of Toronto? Yeah, for study I, I didn't go to UT for this. Okay. But by on our show, Christians have been plotting a backlash to critical race theory for more than three years. So, yeah, we don't just keep our eyes on these assholes for the fun of it. We do it because in four years, they're going to be making laws about what they're workshopping in front of their congregations today. Guaranteed. And in the bookie of life news, <laughs> Christian health insurance is a giant scam. Actually, you know what? Sorry. Let me start over. Yeah. Christianity is a giant scam. There we go. Much also, better. <laughs> pretty much anything that starts with the word Christian or Christianity. And that includes so-called Christian health insurance. Here's how it works. Step one, God's an asshole. Mm -hmm. Step two, in order to spread out the risk of God being a giant asshole across a big group of Christian people, they collect a bunch of money from everyone. And then if someone in the group gets sick, giant asterisk pin in that. <laughs> if somebody gets sick, they tell some healthy people to send their premiums straight to the sick person. And then step three, if you have a non-biblical health need, go fuck yourself. Okay. End of list. So they do understand collectivism. <laughs> they just, just yeah. they need the word okay. Christian at the front. Also, just to be clear, this is very similar to regular insurance in its general concept. Sure. Health insurance companies are giant legalized bookies who take bets about the life and death of human beings. And they profit by taking a middleman cut and by trying to mostly gamble on healthy people. And of course, by refusing to pay out as much as possible. Same racket for the Christian health insurance companies, except they have no rules at the Christian ones. <laughs> and by the way, that's relative to the current health insurance yep. industry. Yes. They're more problematic than that in terms of under regulation. They're basically a segregated country club that can kick you out after years of paying dues if they find out that you know a black person or you're part of a same sex marriage or you want anything uterus related for your health mm -hmm. or literally just because you got sick, which then makes you a bad bet in retrospect. It's insane. In gambling terms, they're allowed to play poker with you until you win a hand and then they can call time out retroactively starting before that hand that you won. Only religion could figure out too evil for health insurance companies. They did it. They religion did it. is the Serena Williams of evil. You think okay, they can't break through. And I, then I, I like that you're doing a sports thing. And I see that. Yes, Serena, it's in a positive thing, sort of, if you really think about what you're saying there. But I don't like associating. She's the, the goat, the greatest of all time. Anyway, go. <laughs> If you want to hear more about this giant scam, check out the June 27th episode of John Oliver's Last Week Tonight. They've done a handful of great takedowns of the Christian blank industry, yes, including Prosperity Gospel and now Health Insurance. And Oliver's British, so, you know, it's automatically smarter and funnier somehow. It's not fair, but that is how it works. It is or, how it works. or you could check out the June 7th episode of opening arguments. Yes, absolutely. Which, I was going to add that too. That's, that's a great point. <laughs> I'm and just saying, either, first. either opening arguments has a time machine they aren't telling us about, or they have a fan at last week tonight. <laughs> I'm pretty like, sure they have a fan. Yeah, this is the ninth time OA has done an episode on something, and then John Oliver's done one right afterwards. I'm, I'm not accusing John Oliver of anything nefarious, but just like, guys, you can hire Andrew. If we can hire Andrew, HBO can hire <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Okay, what about Thomas? Uh, I'm pretty sure T-Dog's all ours. I think okay, Thomas either is way, ours. Either way, here's the moral of the story. Two big takeaways. First of all, don't get involved with anything that starts with the word Christian. Good. This is just a really good heuristic good in advice. life. Yeah. And also, shouldn't they do a prayer pool instead of a money pool? Like, that should be plenty if they're not giant liars. If Ooh, you're not lying, yeah. it's just a prayer pool and you're fine. And if they did that, 
by accomplishing exactly nothing, which is what happens with the prayer pool, by doing nothing, these Christian health insurance companies would actually be way less problematic yeah, than they yeah. are now if they stopped doing money and just did prayers. Yeah, the no would be way better. The zero would be fantastic. <laughs> that would be great news. <sighs> and in failure pile in a sadness bowl news, <laughs> we have a story about Mike Lindell. Yes, we do. And also, you know what? We have an apology for KFC about what I said just now. <laughs> Mike Lindell is way sadder than Patton Oswalt's description of a KFC famous bowl. Yeah. And Lindell gave us another delightful example of that fact when he stopped ugly crying into his very uncomfortable pillow for a minute to headline the latest stop on the Republican Desperation Concert Series last week. And he told the audience, okay, we keep having these failure galas and I keep headlining them and I keep getting this wrong. I keep saying wrong <laughs> stuff about this. Oh, all right, check it out. I'm going to do this one more time. Donald Trump is definitely going to be back in the White House. This time I'm saying by this fall, like for real this time. This fall he's back. Okay, in. can we take the bet? Because, Mike, we'll give you fantastic <laughs> odds, buddy. I'm talking Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather, buddy. I'm Whoa. really good odds. Look at you naming a sports thing. That's yeah. like, That made sense. That I, was, I was in a bar trying to get cool and ESPN was on. Yeah, so. okay. There it is. Yeah. There it is. So the latest failure gala was the Restore America Rally in Tampa, Florida. Florida. Yep. Yeah, yep, Florida. Tracks. Nailed it. It was hosted by the River Church. If that sounds familiar, it's because the head pastor at the River Church is Rodney Howard Brown. Ooh. He's the guy who hires very obvious plants to sit in his mega church audience and have laughing fits. Yep. And then something with Jesus happens. Yeah, There's like a clear. magic thing at the end somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Also, that guy helped kill a bunch of people with COVID. Mm -hmm. So the big rally included that guy, Rodney Howard Brown, along with Lindell, Greg Locke, Roger Stone, uh, and Michael Flynn. Okay. Those are the headliners. Look, I'm not saying it's as bad as 2020, but 2021 has a very series finale feel to it, right? All the bad guys are coming back. I'm just saying there's a vibe. There's a vibe that things are wrapping up. But despite all that competition, all those people I mentioned, Mike Lindell managed to outstupid the whole pack. It's impressive. And it wasn't even close. The concentration of stupid and wrong, it's almost chemically impossible. I don't know how he did it. And I'm actually curious how he stacks up. So you remember a few weeks ago, we had a story about Greg Locke, and he, he scored like six different stupid wrong points in uh, like a hundred words or so. Yeah. Pretty much the same amount of time as Lindell's thing that we're going to tell you about here. So, Eli, you think you can keep score for us as we go? Oh, all right. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so according to Lindell, quote, we're bringing in all the cyber guys. One. That, that is one, yes. Yeah. Then we're bringing all the media. Two. <laughs> And then we're going to bring in all senators, governors, even the corrupt ones, Brian Kemp, and legislatures, secretary of states. Fuck, it's secretaries of state, you dumb fuck. <laughs> and also every single government official that wants to be there. I'm counting that all as one. That was one sentence. So three. three. Okay. <laughs> we're, yeah. We're being generous with just giving you one there. That's three. Fine. Continuing. Because when we show them these packet captures we're gonna give them out to all them cyber guys or <laughs> so, so they can have their own guy go how many votes were flipped here in tampa okay that's a lie it, about a lie five negative <laughs> one heat i'm scared i'm scared <laughs> i don't know fine yeah we'll call that five i guess five yeah so he says we're, we're gonna give give them to the cyber guys so they can have their own guy and go, how many votes were flipped there in Tampa? Here you go, boom. It's going to be a worldwide event. Six. <laughs> Millions are going to see it. Seven. <laughs> and the Supreme Court is going to go 9-0 that this country was attacked. Eight. Donald Trump will be in office by this fall for sure. Nine. The record End stands quote. at nine, ladies and gentlemen. We got a nine. Nine. <laughs> I checked again. There was 114 words from Lindell. <sighs> nine stupid wrong points, and we were being generous. 
Okay, and I still haven't mentioned one extra moment here. Ah, this is haunting us, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know. <laughs> this is fucking nuts. I have no idea how to score this. Y- you call it. Uh, see what you can do. He s- <laughs> he finishes. He finishes with this. He said, "It's called a quo warranto," and he realizes that he just made a series of noises, not like words. I'm pretty uh-huh. sure. So he tries again, and he says. It's called, quote, war and tall. And then he just moves on. I had no idea what, the, I tried to Google this so many different ways. I so watched many different the clip spellings. so many times. I watched it over and over trying to figure out what the noises might have been. The internet had no fucking idea what I was talking about. No idea at all. So what's the score for that? Okay. I don't have a score. I have a theory. Okay. Keith Enright. Could he have been trying to say, Quid pro quo. Absolutely not. No, it's it all was, we have, Heath. We are it, working blind. The, the, <laughs> the no, the the noise was call on. Oh, there's a quid. There's a quo. The, the, yeah, there, the letter Q three. was in it, but that doesn't. It's not the the first vowel noise was not I. It was O for sure. <laughs> so he tried to say like quod prick. No, no, I don't accept that. Absolutely not. <laughs> Fair. So, Fair. yeah, that was nonsense, nearly incomprehensible. But I'm slowly learning to speak Lindell, I think. So tell me if I have this right, just all the right. general concept. Mm-hmm. He has cyber guys, all of them, actually, according yep. to what he said. Yep. And he's pretty sure they're in possession of physical objects yep. that physically contain internet cyber votes that are visibly flipped somehow yeah on the flight map they're gonna hand those physical objects out on video and the supreme court is gonna re-elect donald trump nine to zero because god and pillows and flop sweat and quell warrant dull okay our words keithleton bethesda and right look at me Look warrant, at my heart. Squirrel look, warrant, Keith, troll. look at me. I have never meant this more than I mean it right now. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as you might have already heard, Noah's still recovering from major dental surgery, but we've already got him back for today's episode, and he will be all the way back for everything very soon. But before that happens, we have a handful of headlines that we didn't air yet, that I recorded with Eli over the last few weeks. I'm still here. Here they are, already in progress. Next up in headlines, in Adam and Easement's news, the owner of Aries Tax Service in Radcliffe, Kentucky, Kenneth Lee Randall, is running a special deal right now for new customers. He'll prepare your taxes for just $55 if you file electronically, bring in some pieces of paperwork, and promise not to be gay. Wow. Okay, well, new project. This is going to be fun. I will happily pay for this. You, Eli Bosnick, are going to hire this guy. Yeah. You are going to send him your pallet of shoe boxes full of whatever, like, old-timey calculator tape and cryptex <laughs> riddles, cowrie shells, whatever you have that makes up your tax paperwork. Because I've spoken with our accountant, Tony, after you've done that, and he has gone mad. I, Tony would happily pay for this, too. We could probably get Tony to pay for it. Absolutely. Tony's all in on this. Yes. On his sign, which expresses that he also takes debit cars. What? No. Item J on his list of requirements for the $55 service is, quote, homosexual marriage not recognized, end quote. Fuck your face. Which is weird because the taxes he's offering to prepare do acknowledge all yeah, the do. Yeah, there's a thing. Yep. Uh, You'd you think he'd understand he was missing something. Yeah. Also, I will be delivering his $55 fee in the form of 5,500 matchbox cars with a penny stuffed in each one. <laughs> Most people don't take debit cars, but this guy does. I'm bringing him he debit does. cars. Debit cars. It's on the sign. And when asked about this, Randall doubled down on his bigotry, telling the Courier Journal that he has a, quote, moral objection to homosexual marriage, adding, quote, I have filed and do file for homosexuals who are single as I do not ask about sexual preferences prior to filing a return. Good for you, man. Good for fucking you. This is legal as I have already researched this, end quote. Okay. 
That's not how we're, it's not, le- you researching it had nothing to do with the legality. <laughs> yeah. But that's just a weird moment. He's like, am I, am I being a bigot legally? Great interview question, Courier Journal. <laughs> yes, I am. And I researched it. What the fuck? <sighs> and by the way, he's right. It is legal in Kentucky to discriminate against gay people. Yeah. Just in case you wondered why there was still plenty for us to scathe about. And in great spite, North News. We have an amazing story out of Canada about telling religion to go fuck itself. Ooh. And it all starts with the Grace Life Church in Edmonton. You might remember them from a couple weeks ago when we talked about their pastor, James Coates. Jimmy C. Who responded to the global pandemic by turning his church into a giant COVID Petri dish, just like God intended. Mm-hmm. And because Canada is delightfully passive aggressive, the Alberta Health Department showed up 18 different times <laughs> to help the pastor, you know, spread out chairs and wipe down all the agar gel full of disease that he has <laughs> so that that church might be able to pass a health inspection. And they failed every single time. 18 <laughs> fails in a row. That's 0 for 18. And that's why there's a giant chain link fence around the entire building now, because Canada has a rule that says buildings full of plague Get shut down, at least after 18 <laughs> failures full of plague. Okay, I love the big chain link fence, but I still feel like they should have gone for the back and forthy velvet ropes like at Disneyland. I mean, the cardio <laughs> requirement alone would have dropped his attendance by 75%, people. Think! That would be think. nice, yeah. <laughs> so, I know this is just an obvious response, like a very simple, obvious response to a giant public health hazard. Yeah. But that level of basic logic is so foreign to us Americans. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like this exotic show on Nat Geo about logic (laughs) in its natural environment. And the fence is just the latest. We also got to watch Pastor Coates very easily lose a game of chicken and get arrested, which was also (laughs) great. He spent the last year just daring the Canadian government to do something. And eventually they were like, okay, you're you're under arrest and now your whole building is blocked off. <laughs> Did you see this as a game of chicken? This is just a win win. What for happens us. if we you're get stupid. now we you're under win. arrest? There was nothing for us to be afraid of. <laughs> There's no chicken. You're just under arrest now. I thought maybe you would turn into a ditch. Why? There's no Why ditch. Would I turn I'm just... into... We're government. No. <laughs> and again, I know it sounds silly to marvel at this, but laws count in Canada. Like what? for everyone. They are a fascinating species. Oh, and they never use condoms. Uh, it's is it's that, right there. I'm not 100% never. sure that that's it's true. It's like a very important thing. <laughs> Trust so. For well, Noah not here to stop me. <laughs> so just pretend Noah jumped in and corrected whatever you just said. Pretend Noah said they use condoms. Yeah. So most of Canada is super happy about the very helpful anti-plague fence. We actually have a couple of listeners, good friends, they uh they confirmed that most of Edmonton and the Edmonton area is very happy about the anti plague yeah. fence. So uh yeah, hi Jordan, hi Jenny. But naturally, the Grace Life people had a freak out. They do <laughs> not get a jingle from Anna, by the way. We're not doing no, a freak absolutely. out jingle. No. Their freak out included an absurdly long Instagram post from Aaron Coates, the wife of the pastor, that said, quote, Now they've chained the doors of Grace Life Church in closing in chain link fence. This is all under the guise of a health order. Too bad the church isn't a building. Uh? It's a blood-bought people. Christ has and will prevail, end quote. It's a blood-bought people. That was terrifying. I don't know. Is she sure she's describing her tax-free wish building and not (laughs) uh, Jet Li's character in Unchained? (laughs) Because... That's, sounds like she's describing Jet Li's character in a That is shame. exactly what it sounds like, yes. <laughs> Blood-bought people. That's terrifying. There's no good use of that. No, no nobody has ever no- made a good, salient, measured point that includes the phrase blood-bought people. Except just now. Even if you were stopping it. Yeah. Even if you said, we are putting a stop to blood-bought people, <laughs> someone should be like, oh, you need a better Dude, way to just, put it. I mean, phrasing, <laughs> I, I agree, but still. That's crazy. You sound crazy. (laughs) Now, of course, they also had a protest, like a physical protest, because Mm -hmm. their magic only works in that one building. 
which is weird, though. It, it seems like they'd be fine just doing their magic anywhere. After all, they're a yeah. blood-bought people, not a building. <laughs> But no, they showed up to yell about persecution at the actual door. Yeah. If only there were a part of the Bible about being able to pray at home. They should put that in the Bible. They should. No. Or they no, should read the Bible, is what I should say. It says you need yeah. a blood-bought people. <laughs> <laughs> so they yelled about persecution for a while, but then they got distracted literally by their own racism. It's so And good. they went across the street to a piece of land owned by the Enoch Cree Nation. To do some harassment, vandalism, and attempted assault on the indigenous people of Canada. But then they got redistracted by their own persecution <laughs> narrative again. And they went back to the fence and tore some of it down. And this leads to my favorite part, which I spelled with a U. Favorite with a U part. <laughs> the fence breaking backfired in beautiful Canadian fashion. This is so good. When a few of the protesters actually felt bad and they very politely helped fix the fence that their <laughs> idiot friends had damaged. Please let us move to your country. Please. Please. I never use condoms. <laughs> Next up in headlines in OK Stupid News. America, it's a difficult place for Christian men. Yes. Yeah. It's really hard for them, especially when it comes to finding a female servant to fall in love with. Preach. You got to go to church in person. You have to hope the woman you meet isn't just lying about her enthusiasm about the misogyny out of the extreme social pressure she faces. So common. And, and then you have to trick her into liking you, even though the context of the entire situation is that you're human garbage. Yeah. And yes, the man is in charge. But until you're married... Her dad is the owner, actually. It's tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're probably thinking, there must be a better way. Well, it's finally here. It's called <laughs> Dominion Dating, and there's no feminism allowed. It's in the rules. <laughs> Do you pinky swear to be human, chattel? Because this is serious, guys. Super serious yep. dating. Okay, you click on a thing that says, I agree to be human channel. It's seriously what's happening here. <laughs> Fucking here. iTunes terms and conditions. It's terrifying. Yes, that's real. So, you know, if you're tired of going on Christian Mingle and finding nothing but militant, woke feminists who need to shut their whore mouth, <laughs> you will love Dominion Dating. Here's a few highlights from their official members agreement. I was not exaggerating about that. <laughs> First and foremost, she, the woman on this site, has to declare that Jesus Christ is both Savior and Lord. He's fucking both. He's both. You have to declare. <laughs> halfway assholes. Yeah. The guys have to declare that too. Everybody declares Savior and Lord. Also, she has to promise that she goes to an evangelical church for at least three months prior to joining <laughs> Dominion Day. None of these fly-by-night evangelical <laughs> girls. <laughs> and she will never dress, quote, Sensually or immodestly. Sensually has so many I, red flags. <laughs> baffling, yes. But here's the really good stuff. Quote, we affirm male headship as normative in the spheres of family, church, civil governance, and society at large. So just also all the other stuff. Okay, yeah. Ibid. And <laughs> continuing the quote, and we affirm God's normative plan for women to word. exercise dominion in the home as homemaker and helpmate in glad submission to a husband. We recognize the necessity at times for women to seek employment outside the home, but we reject careerism. <laughs> Okay. End quote. I love that they had to build it. Can you have a hobby job? Because I got fired from yet another Quiznos for fucking a blank Angus sub. Yes, but no making it your life's mission. All right. This is a pause while I wait for my background check to clear up again. That's such a weird extra there. Imagine being such a piece of shit that eventually I will need you to get a job is built into... <laughs> right. Your misogynistic worldview. I'm that horrible, User. but don't get all fucking career -y about it. Now sign <laughs> this document. Yeah. I am the worst, but I'm also the worst. So <laughs> you can work at 5-Eleven on the weekend. There you go. Your chattel contract's right there next to the X. Great. So I checked out Dominion Dating out of morbid curiosity. I checked out sign their site. Up. It is a goddamn nightmare. First of all, their site is... 
Dominion dot dating. <laughs> they, they couldn't quite <laughs> afford a dot net or a dot coffee for no, Dominion. No. Dominion dot dating. And aside from that user agreement slash indentured servitude contract, the most terrifying part, besides the contract, obviously, the most terrifying part is the picture of the two founders. Ooh. It's a married couple, and it looks exactly like Nickelback made a ransom note with a selfie on top. That's <laughs> yeah. what I'm looking at. Okay, so Heath has just posted this picture into our notes, and I have to say, <laughs> it is weird to see this photo without a headline about luring girls to their death underneath it. It's <laughs> yeah. off. Yeah. This juxtaposition is weird. It's just yeah. weird. It belongs with what Eli said. The <laughs> caption says, Brandon and Amanda, in parentheses, Durham, founder. <laughs> The founders are labeled founder, singular, and again, Amanda's name is in parentheses. Brandon, oh. Brandon, and Amanda Durham. You know that they have one Facebook profile. If there's anything I know about these people, they have a single Facebook. Absolutely. They, they also own an answering machine with a tape, and they trade off sentences. Oh, I guarantee yes. it. No question. Also, they have a podcast to promote <laughs> their launch at Dominion Dating, which is happening on August 1st. And they appear to be looking for guest spots with people sharing their stories. Eli, this is very important. We are obviously going to find our way onto that show. Yes. And tell the story of our true love. That oh is happening. Oh my God. Yes, please. Please, yes. <laughs> oh. Also, as of right now, if you want to join the website, you have to back their Kickstarter <laughs> to make the website. To make the website. Oh, let me see. You're not just a member of our weird misogyny <laughs> cult. You're a founder. <laughs> That's exactly correct. Just one final note on this. If we have any K-pop stands out there in the audience. Ooh, careful. They're here's, a well, okay, well, here's something you should not do. I'm saying you okay. should not do this because it would be mean. You should not tell that K-pop army about this. And that army of apparently billions yeah. should not sign up for fake accounts and set up elaborate pranks on the anti-feminist Christian men on Dominion dating. You should not do that. That would be, <laughs> I believe, unethical. Don't do that. Oh, you know not what power you toy with, Ethan, right? <laughs> <laughs> and finally tonight, in trans-sub situation news, Kansas State Representative Mark Samsel, a conservative Christian lawmaker, was arrested last week and charged with misdemeanor battery for assaulting a student while doing his job as a substitute teacher. In a series of interactions caught on video, Samsel threatens several students while talking about the wrath of God, pushes one who then leaves the classroom, and then tells the rest of the class, quote, class, you have permission to kick him in the balls, end quote. In a different video, he then goes on a rant about how he has a student in high school who's tried to kill himself three times because he has two moms. What? And then he asks the entire class if they masturbate, saying, quote, what? Make babies. Who likes making babies? That feels good, doesn't it? Procreate. Uh... You haven't masturbated? Don't answer that question. God already knows, end quote. Cool. Cool. Well, maybe God can share a cell with Josh Duggar because apparently he's watching kids <laughs> masturbate. Just both God, God and Josh Duggar holding a big handful of shit in the same cell. Is it weirder if you hold mine or is it better if you Maybe hold if we mine? just both pile to one so set of hands. I feel my hands, like I shit in yours. We trade off. It's a bonding thing. Days, even odd. Right. All right, rock, paper, scissors. That was a bad idea. <laughs> oh, no, God. <laughs> Why did I choose rock? I squished it. And... Don't worry if all that sounds bad, and it does, there is a great explanation. You see, it was all part of the plan. Sorry, the shit flew everywhere when they did <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so according to Samsel, who gave an interview after being released from jail, quote, every little bit of it. That's right. The kids and I planned all this to send a message about art, mental health, teenage suicide, how we treat our educators and one another. What? To who? Parents and grandparents and all of Wellsville, end quote, adding, I went to jail for battery. Does that really make me a criminal? Um, time will tell and real. Sorry, quote. the answer was yes. Before you said time will tell. That's not how time works. Yes, you're a criminal. Yeah. But just circling back, talking about God watching kids masturbate. 
was sending a message to Wellsville Mm -hmm. about art. Yeah. That was one of the things he was sending a message. (laughs) What message is that? What did that mean? These are great questions. So as of this recording, Samsel has not yet resigned from his position or been fired, but I have a feeling that's coming any second now. Yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on how much the rest of the political body appreciates a good sketch. (laughs) Plus, this is Kansas, so you never know. However, I will say this. He has since released a second, much longer statement. It's like eight pages long in which he references his four favorite sports teams. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Martin Luther King. Great. Great. It's too long and crazy to repeat here. Seriously, it's so fucking Long and crazy, but if you follow us at PIAT Pod on Twitter, you can check out the whole thing. It's <laughs> amazing, my friends. Wow, I, I have to assume he made it worse over eight pages, right? He like did. it could. It so seems like it worse. couldn't get worse, and he made it worse for eight pages. Yep. That's I haven't even read it. I guarantee that's what happened. And welcome back to the present. On that note, we're going to close out the headlines. Eli, time to mention. <laughs> <laughs> and when we come back. Noah is going to be speaking with Chrissy Helton of the Tri-State Freethinkers about Ken Ham's Museum of Old-Timey Landlocked Boating. The pandemic has changed a lot of things over the past 16 months or so, but one thing that it hasn't changed is how hard Ken Ham can go fuck himself. His Ark Encounter theme park, laden as it is with unethical hiring practices, legally dubious tax breaks, and scientific misinformation, stands as a testament to just how much work atheist activists still have to do. And joining me tonight is one of the atheist activists doing that work. Chrissy Helton is one of the co-founders of the Tri-State Freethinkers and in that capacity, one of the organizers of an annual protest against the park that's coming up not this weekend, but next. Chrissy, welcome to The Scathing Atheist. Thank you. Great to be here. It's really great to have you. I I was two years ago, of course, I appeared at the protest. And then last year I was with you guys online and uh, unfortunately couldn't make it this time. But uh, hopefully we can send some listeners in my stead. Fantastic. All right. So few places in the world have more worthy targets of atheist protest than Kentucky. So what is it about the Ark Park in particular that draws you out? There's geez, many reasons. You know, it's it's more of the church state violations, the money that they've obtained from the state with their hiring practice really drew we and other organizations drew awareness to people. This isn't just, you know, a great thing happening in your community. The businesses around there and the employees are paying back two percent of their paychecks to cover funding that they got from the state. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, we want to raise the awareness in which we've we've had miraculous success in doing so, so that people aren't bamboozled by just, oh, this is going to boost our economy, which if you follow the reports, they have not done that. It's lost money every year. So this was just an idea to raise awareness. And we had no idea of the impact that this was going to create for people just to educate themselves. Right. Yeah. And I think it's really important to emphasize that because a lot of people see something like that and they're like, well, you know, why can't Christians have their own amusement park? Well, they can't have it on my tax dollar. Correct. Well, or they shouldn't be able to anyway. Right. So along with, you know, the Tri-State Freethinkers and other organizations, you know, that message was loud and clear that may not have been so loud and clear if if they just kind of did their thing. Mm -hmm. So we're very proud of uh, of that working with so many people just to say hey did you realize this and many people weren't and even now today still talking about it there are still many people that don't understand the mechanics behind their funding right now you know obviously you're in a very christian chunk of the country do you encounter a lot of pushback trying to put this together do you get heckled do you have trouble advertising it stuff like that no actually a lot of people embraced it You know, I think once people realize that maybe some of these hiring practices or funding issues that they have may not directly impact them, but to realize that, you know, somebody down the street may not be able to get a job because they're gay, you have to open the whole picture. You know, there's a few people that drive by when we're there um, protesting that, you know, might flip us off or something, but 
generally it's very well taken. We even have some employees that work at the Ark Encounter come and kind of mingle with us and just ask us questions. So it's pretty well, like I said, embraced. I was a little nervous the first year we did it just because you're not sure of, you know, the outcome of it or what kind of conflicts you're going to encounter. But it was surprisingly well taken. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, that was my experience as well, that the majority of people that stopped or, or slowed down to say something or yell something were yelling something in support. Right. Even there in Kentucky. That's great. So I'm sure we've got a few listeners who are in the general area. They have the day free. They're on the cusp of deciding to come out for it. Can you give them the hard sell? Why should people come out and join your protest? Well, first of all, it's free. (laughs) It's outdoors. It's a great time just to not only stand up for what we need to stand up for, the discrimination and things of that nature, But it's a great opportunity to network with other organizations, other folks. We have amazing speakers. You've been one of our speakers. Just some great entertainment as well. This year, we're excited. We have Caitlin Poulter coming out. She's an American songwriter, visual artist. So this is the first time we're going to have some music there. um, And we're super excited about her coming. But it's just a a great network of like-minded people. We have... Many people that travel, you know, from various different states just to come. And unfortunately, we couldn't do that last year. And, you know, hopefully those folks that couldn't make it out last year due to the pandemic, we will see them this year. So it's it's just a great time to network and, and send your message. Yeah, yeah, it's a great community. Now, you kind of touched on my next question. I think this is something that's obviously uh, near and dear to a lot of people. There are still very reasonable concerns about COVID, especially with the Delta variant on the rise. Mm-hmm. What precautions are you taking to keep everybody safe in that regard? Yeah, it's it's been a tough year. I mean, we've battled back and forth. You know, do we do it in person? Do we do it virtual this year? Do we do it, in, you know, so we've kind of just, you know, been watching the CDC, trying to follow their guidelines. The plus side of it that this is an outdoor event. We will do everything that we can to follow the CDC guidelines to keep everybody safe. Those folks who are going to set up any kind of tents to promote their organizations will make sure that they're, you know, spaced out. Usually we do that two by two rule to march up to the ARC encounter Mm -hmm. with the banner. You know, we'll take different measures, just single person file. So we're going to do everything that we can. Folks are welcome to wear their masks if they choose to. We will have some there on site if, if folks need them. So excellent. do what we can. Awesome. Awesome. So now you've already said that you're, you know, the, the, the point here is to raise awareness. But once you've raised awareness, what what are people going to do with the awareness? Like, What is the ultimate goal in organizing these protests? The ultimate goal is change. You know, we've been out here on on that location protesting ever since they opened back in 2016 just like anybody that goes to the state houses calling their congressmen and women we're going to keep coming with this message that this is wrong and equality should apply to everybody um, until they change their practices it's not necessarily against you know people's religious views this is more of a church state violation and, you know, the fight for equality. Awesome. Awesome. As, as noble a goal as you can have in it. So what kind of things do the tri-state free thinkers do when they're not holding Ken Ham's feet to the fire? <laughs> well, again, you know, everybody's experienced some hardship with COVID. We operate under what we call an ACES program, activism, community service, education, and social so we take part in activism events such as protesting the ARC. We participate in the women's reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, equality, anything that's a basic human right that we need to be that voice for, we are an advocate for. We do many, many ser- uh, community service projects. Pre-COVID, we were doing about 50 per year. Oh, wow. Most of our things have been local drives, you know, this year. But we're starting to get our feet back in the ground, getting back into facilities. We also hold educational meetings every month. The first Wednesday of each month, we have a speaker come in and talk about things that are relevant and that that people 
you know, want to make a change or need to hear about. So we hold those educational meetings. And then, of course, we have social events, you know, like disc golfing is something that we've been doing, something that we can do outside. We used to host game nights on Fridays. Um, Haven't got back into those yet because of COVID. But, you know, try to build that sense of community because that's that is one thing that churches do have um, as an upper leg is mm-hmm. that sense of community. So we try to build that sense of community. In, in a lot of ways, I think that's the theme of this week's show. <laughs> All right. So I, speaking of community, I want to shift gears a little bit here because I know there are a lot of people who, you know, might not be able to make this protest because of the timing or because of the geography, but they have plenty of church state violations in their own neck of the woods that they would like to raise their voices against. So what advice do you have for somebody who's trying to organize a protest for the first time? I say speak up. I mean, I'm just going to base it on kind of back in 2012 when, you know, Jim and I were talking about forming a group, which now is the Tri-State Freethinkers. You know, if you have an idea or something that you think is important, share it with people. There are like-minded people out there who are afraid to speak up. You know, like we had our first meeting, we had like six or seven people show up. Well, they have six or seven people that they know that have the same mindset, the same passion, you know, you got to get the word out there and then, you know, just delegate organizers. And there's a group in your community that will support anything that you have an idea for, like the LGBTQ rights or qualities. We have PFLAG, we have GLSEN, we have the Human Rights Campaign. You know, there's so many organizations that you can reach out to. Somebody just needs to be that voice to start that, you know, that conversation. Yeah, and I think it's important to remind people that even if you're in a part of the country that is overwhelmingly religious, like like you actually are, there are plenty of people out there that still that have this same passion and that care about these issues or people that would care about these issues if they were brought to them. Right. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, obviously, I wish I could have been there again this year. I had an awesome time when I did come. Hopefully, like I said, we can send some of our listeners. If they want to know more about the protest, just check the show notes for this episode. There'll be links to more information. And Chrissy, thank you so much for hanging out with us. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, we'll set a date and hopefully we can get you here next year. Excellent. Excellent. Before we take out our teeth tonight, I wanted to thank everybody who sent messages of support over the last few weeks. And I especially want to thank Heath, Eli, Lucinda, Tim, Morgan, Andrew, and Don for stepping up and helping out in my absence. Anyway, that's all the blast maybe we've got for you this week. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Rat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Fuck, I need to slow down. Obviously, this wouldn't be a real show if I neglected to thank all the people I just thanked at the outset. But but I also want to thank Chrissy one more time for hanging out tonight. Remember, the protest is on Saturday, July 10th in Williamstown, Kentucky, and they would love to see you there. Oh, also need to thank the mods for our unofficial fan group on Facebook for providing this week's Farnsworth quote and for moderating our unofficial fan group, even though people keep posting dicks in it. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's, last week's, the week before that, and the week before that's best people. And I know you're probably thinking that I can't do this, say everybody's name real fast in a single breath thing now that I have dentures, but I've still got that shit. <gasps> Bunnyhood, BC, Kuiper Belt, Transport, Shapeshifting Demons, Sarah, Kendall, John, Dominic, James, Rob, OA, Save My Soul, Amy, Siv, Appropriately Inappropriate, Former Internet Spaceship Recruiter, Graham, Kevin, Plug Whatever You Want in Here, Chelsea, Jerome, Lex, El Kid, San Diego, Ray, Joshua, Michael, Space Ace, David, Bruce, Katie, Joe, Brain, Scalderon, Just John, and Derek, who are more mouthwatering than holding an undigestible hunk of plastic in your mouth all the time. Sorry, if you have dentures, that totally makes sense. Together, these 34 flirty... No shit, nothing complimentary rhymes with four, so I'm just going to take a mulligan and go with awesome people. Made it that much easier for us to tell Jesus Freaks to fuck off this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some of it to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help but money's been avoiding you, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIETPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are brought to the offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Ooh.
I would like to say has been lo- no what <laughs> don't I don't almost run, anchor don't Ron Burgundy me. I ran I Ron Burgundy I got so close to Ron Burgundy don't, him don't do that. <sighs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.